Do you feel ignorant because you don't know numbers? You don't know which one go which way and they got all these marks and things on them? I know, honey, it's hard. But there is a solution. Fort Bend tutoring. And now here go Mr. Whit. Explain math to us, Mr. Whit. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mr. Whit with Fort Bend Tutoring. And today we have a fun tutorial over transformations of functions. But first, let's review over the basic parent functions that you'll find. All right. So here we have number one. Yeah. A linear function. It's just a line. It's just a line. And matter of fact, none of the examples in this video are going to deal with linear functions. We have plenty of videos over how to graph a linear function, ladies and gentlemen. So check those out. All right. But we still will be reviewing over those common transformations so you can apply those to linear functions. Moving on, moving on. You have the quadratic function. That's right. The highest exponent is 2. It's going to be a parabola, a U shape. Mm -hmm. Then you have your cubic function here, and it makes a little snaky snake, mm -hmm. a little snaky snake, just like that. That's going to be your cubic function right there. Y equals X cubed is the basic parent function for that. And then continuing on, you have the absolute value. It's going to be a V shape. Uh-huh, a V shape is going to be your absolute value function. Continuing on, you have a rational function, all right? And once again, this is just the parent function. There are different forms of rational functions, but we're just going to be dealing with the parent function, the basic function, and the transformations to that. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have your square root function, y equals to the square root of x, all right? And there you have your basic parent function there, all right? So those are going to be your basic parent functions, all right? So you need to be aware of those and what they look like. And just to let you know, we'll be focusing on the transformation of these functions, but when it comes to graphing them, we'll actually have an exact graph. We won't be too concerned about a sketch. And that's where I personally prefer the exact science of math and knowing exactly how to graph a function rather than just knowing what it looks like. Knowing what it looks like is good for multiple choice, but we want you to know exactly how to graph each of these transformations. All right, so let's move on. What we have before you is an example of a quadratic function. All right, and I've broken it down into a format to where you can see these four values that are going to help us define the transformations. And that is the A, B, C, and D here. That's right, the first four letters of the alphabet. All right, they're going to help you define exactly what type of transformations you'll find in the functions that we'll be showing you in this lesson today. All right, so if this quadratic function had a vertical stretch, that would mean that its absolute value of the a value would be greater than 1. Mm -hmm. If that function had a vertical shrink, that absolute value of a would be between 0 and 1. In other words, it would be a value greater than 0 and less than 1. It would be a proper fraction or a decimal between 0 and 1. Then, if this function has a horizontal stretch, then the absolute value of its b value is going to be between 0 and 1, once again being either a proper fraction or a decimal between 0 and 1. All right. Now, the scale factor that you'll have for this horizontal stretch will be 1 divided by the absolute value of your B value. Now, sometimes your instructor or your textbook will request the scale factor of that horizontal stretch. So if you need that value, you simply will place the 1 over the absolute value of your B value and then simplify it, and that'll be the scale factor. Likewise, if this function has a horizontal shrink, the absolute value of its B value is going to be greater than 1, and you can find your scale factor of that by placing 1 over the absolute value of that B value. All right, that's going to be the horizontal shrink of the function. Then on to simpler things, like the horizontal shift. The horizontal shift is just going to be the C value. That's right, the C value would determine which way the function will be shifted to the left or the right. Okay, then if you're looking at the vertical shift, the D value, this value tells you how far up or down your function has been shifted. And when I speak of shifts, I'm talking about a translation. You're sliding your original graph up or down or left or right. Okay, so that's what I mean by horizontal shift and vertical shift. Then you can have a reflection of the function, which basically just flips it across the x-axis or the y-axis. So in order to have a reflection across your x-axis, which means you're going to reflect it top to bottom, then you're going to have a value of a that's negative. 
You can also have a reflection across your y-axis, which means that you flipped your function from left to right. And that simply means that the function has a b value that happens to be negative. All right. So that's how you can decipher, translate all of these values from the original function that's given to you. All right. To find out its transformations. Okay. So let's continue on. So remember I was referencing the A, the B, the C, the D values? Yeah. Well, I wanted you to know the format that I'm placing each of these functions into in order to get those values. For instance, if I have a quadratic function, I would write it as Y equals to A times the quantity of B times X minus C squared plus D. Mm -hmm. If it's cubic, I would have it written as Y equals A times the quantity of B times X minus C raised to the third power plus D. And if it's an absolute value function, I would have it written as Y equals to A times the absolute value of B times X minus C plus D. And then if it's a square root function, I would have Y equals to A times the square root of B times the quantity of X minus C plus D. And then if it's rational, all right, check that out. I would have Y equals A times 1 over B times X minus C plus D. All right. So as long as you can place your given equations in these forms, you can easily find what your A value, your B value, your C value and your D value is. Yeah. All right. Let's look at some problems. In problem number one, we have y equals x squared plus 2. I already know that this is going to be a quadratic function. All right, the highest exponent is 2. And basically, I'm looking at my parent function over here, and it's going to be a parabola. It's going to be a U shape. I already know this already. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what I can do to the given equation to put it into a form to where I can find out what that A, that B, that C, and that D value is. All right, so I can rewrite this function as y equals the quantity of x minus 0 squared plus 2. All right. What that does for me is that tells me that my a value is 1, that my b value is 1, that my c value is 0, and that my d value is 2. So bottom line is, since my a and my b values are 1, I don't have any type of stretching or shrinking going on in this problem. In addition to that, because my c value is 0, I don't have a horizontal shift. The only change to my original parent function is that I have a vertical shift of 2. Remember that D value tells you whether or not you have a vertical shift. And that vertical shift is a positive 2, which means that this U shape will be moved up two places. And that's it. However, let's go ahead and find out some exact values for our graph here. And what I'll do is I'll be plugging in these x values here. And these are values that I chose based on where the vertex of this parabola was going to be, which normally would have been at 0, 0. However, since I know I'm moving it up to, the vertex will be at 0, 2. All right, so from this vertex, I have 0, 2 here. Then plugging in negative 1 into the original equation, negative 1 squared is is 1. 1 plus 2 is 3, which means that positive 1 will also be 3. If I plug in negative 2 into the original function, that negative 2 squared would be positive 4, and then 4 plus 2 is 6. So I have a value of 6 here, as well as 6 for positive 2 as well. All right, so from here, we can go ahead and plot our graph, ladies and gentlemen. So I'll start out with my vertex of 0, 2. So I'll have a point right here. Then I have a point at negative 1, 3. Negative 1, 3, that's right here. I have a point at 1, 3. That takes me here. I also have a point at negative 2, 6. We'll say that that's right there. And then I also have a point at 2, 6, which is going to be about right there. From here, we'll go ahead and connect the dots, and that'll be my function. Done and done, ladies and gentlemen. That's the graph. All right. So notice that the graph is no longer based at the origin. It's actually been moved up two places on the y-axis. And that's it. That's problem number one. All right, in our second problem here, we have y equals negative x cubed. What I know is that I'm dealing with a cubic function because of the parent function y equals x cubed is very similar to the equation that we have before us. I know that the parent function's graph will be this little snaky snake right here. And I also know that I have 
only one visual change between the parent function and this problem right here and that's that my a value is negative that's right the a value is negative one and if I wanted to expand this to show all the a the b the c and the d I could rewrite it as y equals negative times the quantity of x minus zero cubed plus zero Okay, so if I wanted to place this equation into a format to where I could gather my A, my B, my C, my D values, I could rewrite it just like that. This tells me that my A value is negative 1, that my B value is 1, that my C value is 0, and that my D value is also 0. So I don't have any horizontal or vertical shifts. I don't have a horizontal shrink or stretch. I also don't have a vertical stretch or shrink. But what I do have is a reflection because my A value is negative. That tells me that it's going to be flipped across the x-axis. So I have a reflection across the x-axis in problem number two. So let's see how that pans out as far as graphing it. What we'll do is we'll plug in these values here that I choose because I like small numbers. And plugging in zero into that original function, mm -hmm, that y equals negative x cubed, you'll still get zero. That's it. If I plug in negative 1 into the original function, that'll give me a positive 1 as a result. If I plug in negative 2 into that original function, I'll end up with a positive 8. And then plugging in positive 1 will give me a negative 1 as a value. And plugging in positive 2, I'll have negative 8 as a result. From here, I'll go ahead and plot those points. That's it. Okay, so starting out, I have 0, 0, and then if I plot my 1, negative 1, I'll be right here, yeah, then I have a negative 1, 1, I'll plot that, there you go, and then I have negative 2, 8, that's going to take me way up here, way up there, and then I'll have a point at 2, negative 8, and that's going to be way down there somewhere. Way down there. We'll just say it's down there. Okay, so now to connect our dots here with a little snicky snake like so all right and there's the graph ladies and gentlemen and if you notice it's been flipped from the graph that we have in our parent function all right so normally it looks like that notice that it's been flipped around all right vertically that is vertically flipped there you go that's the graph that's problem number two let's move on In problem number three, we have a rational function. And notice that we have our parent function here to the upper right to show you what this graph would normally look like. However, we have x minus three in the denominator instead of just x. If you revert back to that format for the rational function that I gave you earlier, you'll notice that it's already in a perfect form to find out what our a, b, c, and d values are. In fact, those values are a equals to one, b equals to one, c equals equals to 3 and D equals to 0. So these are going to be the values that are used. So knowing that A and B is 1, that tells me that there are no vertical shrinks or stretches, no horizontal stretches or shrinks, but there is a horizontal shift. In fact, there's a horizontal shift three places to the right. Now, when you're looking at your horizontal shifts here, it's always going to be the opposite sign of what you're dealing with. And if you look at the format that I gave you, it's always X minus C. So when I'm asking you for the C value, always change the sign of that value that you see in the function. All right. So C in this case is three. There you have it. All right. So that being the case, I know that this original function is just going to be shifted over three places to the right. So because of that, I've chosen the following values to help me graph it. So let's go ahead and plug those in into the original equation to find out what our y values are, okay? So if I plugged in zero here into the original function, I would end up with negative one third. So that'd be negative one third, like so. Plugging in positive one, you end up with negative one half, all right? Plugging in two, you'll end up with negative one. All right. Plugging in positive 4, you'll end up with positive 1. Plugging in 5, you'll end up with 1 half. And then plugging in 6, you'll end up with 1 third. All right. So let's grab these six points on our rectangular coordinate system here. Okay. So starting out with 0, negative 1 third. I have 0, negative 1 third is right here. Okay. Good job. Then 1 is at negative 1 half, so that's going to be about right there. And then I have 2 at negative 1. 2 is going to be at negative 1 right there. And then I have a value at 4 that's at 1. Then I also have 5 at 1 half. 
and then I have 6 at 1 third. All right. Now, what I didn't mention is if you look at your original parent function, you have an asymptote at x equals 0. In other words, this graph is avoiding the y-axis. What we have done with that horizontal shift is move that asymptote three places to the right, okay? So, in other words, this graph, our new graph, will be avoiding x equals to 3. So, that means that I'll have a vertical asymptote here at x equals 3. Mm -hmm. Not only that, you also have a horizontal asymptote right here along the x-axis. You won't touch that at all. So I have a vertical asymptote here at x equals to 3. I also have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So this graph will also avoid the x-axis. So the graph will move along these points this way and avoid the x-axis as well as x equals to 3. I'll also have the graph moving here to the right of x equals to 3, avoiding the x-axis, as well as x equals to 3. So that's going to be the graph. There you have it. It's been shifted over three places to the right. Done and done. That's problem number three. All righty. In problem number four, we have another quadratic function. We have y equals to the quantity of x plus 2 squared minus 3. Notice I have here to the right my parent function for a quadratic equation, which is y equals x squared, and we know it's going to be a parabola, a u-shape here. So looking at the values of a, b, c, and d for this function, I know that my a value will be 1. I know that my b value is going to be 1. I know the c value would be negative 2. Remember your c value is always the opposite of that value inside of the parentheses. Always take the opposite sign of that value. Then your d value is going to be exactly what you see there. It will be negative 3. So what does that tell us? That tells us that we don't have a vertical shrink or stretch. We do not have a horizontal shrink or stretch, but we do have a horizontal shift of negative 2, two places to the left, and we also have a vertical shift down three places. That's what that negative 3 means, all right? So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Now, to put this into practice, we can go ahead and find out our y values. Okay, plugging in negative 4 into our original equation, negative 4 plus 2 is negative 2. Negative 2 squared is 4, and 4 minus 3 is 1. Mm -hmm. Plugging in negative 3, negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1. Negative 1 squared is positive 1, and 1 minus 3 is negative 2. Plugging in negative 2, negative 2 plus 2 is 0, so that just gives me negative 3. Plugging in negative 1, negative 1 plus 2 is 1, 1 squared is 1, and 1 minus 3 is negative 2. And then plugging in 0, I'll end up with 2, 2 squared is 4, and 4 minus 3 is 1. And let's go ahead and plot those points. All right, so we'll start out with our vertex of negative 2, negative 3. Negative 2, negative 3 would be right here. And notice you could have found out your vertex easily by changing the sign on this 2 to a negative 2 and then keeping that negative 3 for your y value you would have a vertex of negative 2 negative 3 so that's something good to know when it comes to graphing parabolas alright continuing on with our plotting here our next point is going to be negative 3 negative 2 so negative 3 negative 2 is here then I have negative 1 negative 2 that gives me a point here I have 0 1 is right there I got negative 4 1 is right here and then I just go ahead and connect the dots here all right, so let's connect these with a nice little U-shape. And there's my parabola with exact points. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That was problem number four. And notice how we have moved the original parent function to the left two places and down three places between that and this. There you have it. That's our transformation for problem number four. Let's continue on. All right, we have problem number five with a radical, a square root involved. And our parent function for that, here you go, y equals to the square root of x, is shown in the upper right of your screen. So this form is a decent form, but we can make it better in order to identify our a, b, c, d values by rewriting it like so. I'll say I have y equals to the square root of negative 1 times x minus 3. So what just happened here? And I could say it's even plus 0. So what I did was I factored out a negative 1 from the radicand, all right? That allowed me to rewrite it, separating
taking that B value from that X minus C value within my given radicand. All right. So that helps me to identify that I have an A value of 1, a B value of negative 1, a C value of 3, and a D value of 0. This tells me that I do not have a vertical shrink or stretch. I don't have a horizontal shrink or stretch, but I do have a reflection across the y-axis because that B value is negative. So it will be flipped around. Instead of pointing to the right as this parent function does, the graph instead will move over to the left. All right, so it's been flipped across that y-axis. In addition to that, we have a horizontal shift of positive 3. Remember, whatever you find inside the parentheses, you'll change the sign on that value of C. All right, so that means that my horizontal shift is 3. Now, let's go ahead and come up with some values to plug in. All right, so we're going to choose values of negative 6, negative 1, 2, and 3 to plug into this function here. All right, that being the case, plugging in negative 6 into the original function will give me a positive 6 plus 3 is 9, and the square root of 9 is 3. Plugging in negative 1, negative negative 1 is positive 1. 1 plus 3 is 4. The square root of 4 is 2. Plugging in 2, negative 2 plus 3 is 1. The square root of 1 is 1. And plugging in 3, negative 3 plus 3 is 0. So the square root of 0 is 0. So these will be the points that I plug in and plot on the graph here. So let's start out with the first one. We have negative 6, 3. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 3. That takes me to a point here. Then I have negative 1, 2, which gives me a point right here. Then I have 2, 1, which is right here. And then I also have 3, 0. All right, connect my dots. Bam, put an arrow on the end, boom. So what just happened, all right? The first thing is that our original parent function has been flipped, so that is no longer rising to the right, it's rising to the left. And in addition to that, it's been moved over three places to the right, okay? So notice that we have that positive three value for C. That tells us that there has been a horizontal shift three places to the right. Okay, so there you go. There's your graph. There is your graph, ladies and gentlemen done and done with exact points. Let's move on. Number six. All right, in problem number six, we have y equals the absolute value of one half x plus two minus one. We know that its parent function is a V shape, okay? And we also want to learn what our A, B, C, and D values are. So in order to do that, let's go ahead and rewrite this as y equals to the absolute value of one half times x plus four Close your absolute value sign, then minus 1. Okay. By doing that, I can isolate the B value, all right? I would know exactly what that B value is. I know that my A value is 1, my B value is 1 half, and my C value would be negative 4. You always change the sign of that value inside the parentheses there, and my D value would be negative 1. We don't have a vertical shrink or stretch in this problem, but we do have a horizontal stretch. Remember, if the absolute value of B is between 0 and 1, that's a horizontal stretch. So we have a horizontal stretch in this problem. Our horizontal shift is negative 4, which means that the V shape will be moved to the left. All right. And then you have your D value of negative 1, which means we will be moving it down 1. All right. So let's see what happens for this problem. Let's come up with some values. All right, for this function, I've chosen negative 8, negative 6, negative 4, negative 2, and 0. If you're familiar with the absolute value function, you would know that the vertex of this function is going to be negative 4, negative 1. All right, all I had to do is change the sign on that 4 and then go ahead and take that negative 1 as it is for the vertex. But we can prove this by plugging in these points right here. If I start with the negative 4, negative 4 plus 4 is 0 right so that means that I would end up with zero times a half is still zero and that would just leave me with negative one alright then let's say that I plug in negative six negative six plus four is gonna be negative two half of negative two is gonna be negative one the absolute value of negative one is one and then one minus one is zero so I have a value of zero here at negative six as well as negative two being as though they are symmetric then let's plug in zero. That looks easy. Plugging in zero, zero plus four is four, half of four is two, absolute value of two is still two, and then two minus one is one. All right, 
So these are going to be the values that I will plot. All right. Now, keep in mind that we had a horizontal stretch, which means that your graph is literally going to be stretched kind of thin from your original parent function. All right. So let's see what that looks like. Here we'll begin with the vertex of negative 4, negative 1. So I'm here at negative 4. Then I go down to negative 1. I then have negative 6, 0, which is right here. I also have another point at negative 2, 0 there. And then I have the point 0. 1 which is here and I also have a point of negative 8 1 which would be approximately here all right so notice how this is much fatter looking than our original parent function right there okay so let's go ahead and connect the dots on this so you'll do just that connect the dots and put arrows on both ends oh yeah there you go and here is your graph there you have it ladies and gentlemen it has been horizontally stretched you got it. And shift it over to the left four places. Check that out. It's already done. Done and done. All right. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That was problem number six. We had several transformations in that one. Let's move on to our next problem. And our final problem for this lesson, I'll show you what occurs when you're given a function, all right, such as this, and they call this function f, and they're asking you to find out a new function using a transformation. In order to get g, they're telling you to make a horizontal shift on your function f because we have that negative 2 inside the parentheses, which means that it's going to be a horizontal shift of positive 2. Remember, inside the parentheses, you're going to change the sign on that. And you have a vertical shift of negative 1. So in other words, my x values are going to go up 1. They're going to increase by 2. And my y values, they're going to go down by 1. All right, so because I have a horizontal shift two places to the right because of that C value of positive 2, my D value is negative 1, and it's literal, which means that if it's negative 1, you're going down 1. You don't need to change the sign when it comes to the vertical shift. So all I have to do is take the given points from my graph, which I've already labeled here, negative 2, 5, 0, 1, 3, 2, and 4, 0, and simply apply these changes to each and every value. So once again, all of my X values will increase by 2. So let's just add 2 to each one of these X values. The negative 2 will become 0. The 0 will become 2. The 3 will become 5. And the 4 will become 6. Then all of my Y values will decrease by 1. So I'll take that 5 and make it a 4. I'll take the 1 make it a 0. I'll take the 2 make it a 1 and take the 0 and make it a negative 1 like so. So now I have all of the new points of the G function that they're asking me for. So let's do just that. Let's go ahead and plot these points and then show on the same graph what it'll look like. We'll start by plotting 0, 4. Here I have 0, 4 right here. Then I have 2, 0, which is right there. I have 5, 1, which will give me a point here. And then I'll have 6, negative 1, which will give me a point right there. So if I connect those dots there, I'll have this graph right here, which will show my change. And here our graph shows that we had a horizontal shift two places to the right, and that that point was moved down one for every point within that function. Okay, so there you have it. Not only do you have the exact points, you also have the graph to reflect that transformation. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Witt with Fort Bend Tutoring. We hope that you found this video helpful, and as always, please rate, comment, and subscribe. And if you're able, please donate, as that helps us bring you more free math videos from me, Mr. Witt, and Fort Bend Tutoring. Peace. We certainly hope you enjoyed today's presentation by Fort Bend Tutoring. Did you understand the program? Would you like to rate us or give us some feedback or subscribe to us? You could do all that on tutormemath.net.